The committee will come to order. Uh, before we begin, I, uh, unanim I ask unanimous consent that members not on a subcommittee be permitted to sit with the subcommittee at today's hearing and ask questions. Uh, the purpose of today's hearing is to discuss how the country can protect its infrastructure from disaster damage, control disaster spending, and ensure uh, the Federal Emergency Management Agency is able to respond when the nation needs it most. These are difficult challenges, and I'm excited that our witnesses have brought some bold ideas to the table for tackling these problems. Addressing the rising costs of disaster, both in terms of property and human life, is my top emergency management priority. It comes as no surprise that disaster costs have grown considerably over the past three decades. What may be surprising is that this increase is caused by a small number of really big disasters. Take a look at this slide. The Congressional Research Service reviewed disaster declarations and spending since 1989 and found that the vast majority of federal disasters are small and have little impact on total spending. In fact, one quarter of declared disasters, that means the big ones, account for 93% of all costs. In other words, we could eliminate three quarters of all federally declared disasters and barely cut 7% from federal disaster spending. These facts are in direct contradiction to the common wisdom that disaster spending is growing because the number of federally declared disasters is growing. That simply is not true. In addition, I would argue the, um, the amount saved by eliminating those smaller disaster declarations would not outweigh the benefit they provide in helping our smaller, remote communities respond to and recover from disasters. So what can be done to bend the cost curve on big disasters, which is where over 90% of the money goes? This is the big challenge, and our witnesses have brought some bold ideas to the table for Congress to consider. Administrator Fugate, while he was at the helm at FEMA, promoted the idea of a disaster deductible to ensure states have skin in the game before they are eligible to receive disaster assistance. The Build Strong Coalition has proposed an array of, of ideas, including federal cost share adjustments, to encourage states to take steps to strengthen infrastructure and reduce disaster damages over time. Consolidating disaster recovery programs administered by 19 different federal agencies under FEMA is also recommended. Congress needs to give these and other proposals serious consideration. Right after I became a member of Congress in 2011, my own district was hit hard by Hurricane Irene and Tropical Storm Lee. As we were rebuilding, I was amazed that much of the federal assistance was used to rebuild in the same place in the same way, leaving people vulnerable to the next storm. The federal government has a responsibility to respond after a disaster, but we also have a duty to be good stewards of taxpayer dollars and ensure what is rebuilt can withstand the next disaster. Finally, as we sit here one month away from the start of the Atlantic hurricane season, FEMA is still without a nominee for FEMA administrator. This is a critical and important time for FEMA, and unfortunately, it is vulnerable. As Administrator Fugate observes in his written statement, as recently as 2016, FEMA's authorities were under assault. We must remain vigilant to ensure FEMA has the necessary protections and authorities so that it is ready and able to respond when the country needs it most. I look forward to your testimony and your ideas for how the country can protect itself from the growing cost of large disasters. And thank you for being here. Uh, at this time, I'd like to recognize the chairman of the full committee, Mr. Schuster. Uh, thank you very much, Chairman Barletta, uh, for holding this important hearing today. I appreciate our witnesses being here. Um, and since the beginning of this Congress, uh, we've had a president that got elected that's been talking about the need to invest in our infrastructure. And, uh, and, and what FEMA does plays a, plays a key role in uh, protecting that or making sure that we're doing the right things uh, uh, when we're, we're building 
whether it's infrastructure of the federal government or whether it's the infrastructure that uh, we build and the homes that we build, the buildings that we build around the, uh, around the country. So I've told them to be bold. Let's get great big ideas out there. I think we're going to have an opportunity uh, this year uh, to do a big infrastructure bill, and that's going to probably include everything this committee, every uh, uh, part of this committee's jurisdiction, and it'll include some other things that this committee doesn't do, uh, uh, like uh, building out more broadband access and, and building uh, uh, improving our, our power generation grid. So uh, we have a real opportunity here to do some, some important things. Uh, so again, we want to make sure we're bold. I appreciate uh, uh, the testimony today. Uh, some of the testimony I've seen is there are some bold ideas out there. One of the things that I, I had the great fortune to do, and I would encourage all members to go down to the IBHS down in South Carolina and watch them burn a house or blow a house away or whatever they do. Uh, but that really is important work that the insurance industry is putting together uh, and what they've been told me for a couple thousand dollars on a couple hundred thousand dollar home, you can do some things to it that make it uh, withstand uh, some of these natural disasters. So those are the kinds of things we need to be, be looking at. It's not something that I want to regulate from the federal government because, you know, what's good in South Carolina maybe doesn't work in Pennsylvania. But, uh, but encouraging uh, states to, to be looking at these kinds of things to make sure that, uh, again, when a natural disaster occurs, you've got buildings there that can, can withstand this better so that the federal government, uh, as the chairman pointed out, doesn't continue to have to spend these huge amounts of money. I mean, that's one of the most important things we do is the response uh, to natural disasters. And uh, uh, again, it's one of the most important things this committee uh, has jurisdiction over. So making sure we're doing the right thing uh, is, is really important for us. So I know that uh, Administrator Fugate's testimony is talking about the issue of uh, the, the agency's authorities um, and appreciate his, his work. And uh, he was able to, uh, through a personal relationship with the president, he had the direct relationship to the president. So when something happened, uh, he was the guy they were turning to in, in, natural, in these disasters that occur. Uh, and I hope that the, this administration carries that on. Uh, when, we, when they put DHS, uh, or when they, excuse me, when they put FEMA into DHS, that was something that I, I posed. I didn't think it was the best fit. Uh, but it is what it is now, and now we've got to figure out how to, how to manage it as best we can. Um, as I said, uh, controlling these, these, uh, the mitigation, the response uh, to, these, uh, to these natural disasters is, is, is really taxing uh, the, the federal government when they happen. Uh, again, those numbers that the chairman put up there are, are, are quite staggering, uh, that, that so few things cost, cost the federal government so, so much money. Uh, but again, I look forward to, uh, to hearing the testimony of our witnesses today, and I really appreciate you being here to help educate uh, the committee on these issues. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Chairman Schuster. And uh, I now call on the ranking member of the subcommittee, Mr. Johnson, for a brief opening statement. I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I apologize for being late. I was given a, a speech, and I got a little long-winded, I think, and lost control at the time. But I thank you all for being here, and I... Uh, say good morning to you. We all know that disaster costs and losses are rising. It is likely that every member of this committee has seen disasters strike in their district or in their state. While we cannot control Mother Nature, we can do something to lower disaster costs and losses. Both the Congressional Budget Office and the National Institute of Building Sciences Multi-Hazard Mitigation Council found that for every dollar invested in pre-mitigation, in mitigation pre-disaster, three, <coughs> three to four dollars respectively are saved in future disaster spending. Today's he hearing is timely because while we are discussing the importance of mitigating future disaster damages in an attempt to control rising disaster costs and losses, President Trump has proposed to cut or eliminate funding for the Federal Emergency Management Agency's pre-disaster mitigation grant program in his so-called skinny budget. President Trump would be wise to heed the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. State and local communities use pre-disaster mitigation funds to develop hazard mitigation plans, retrofit infrastructure to protect it from floods, earthquakes, and other hazards, converting flood-prone land to open space, and other critical projects. Mitigating disaster damage also saves lives and reduces injuries, which is why I was disheartened to learn that FEMA 
had placed an administrative hold on fiscal year 2016 and 2017 pre-disaster <coughs> pre mitigation grants and on many non-disaster preparedness grants because the President's executive order prohibited funding to so-called sanctuary cities. Thankfully, two days ago, a federal judge issued a temporary injunction on enforcing President Trump's executive order, allowing FEMA to award these essential grants. We must be vigilant to ensure that the administration does not once again try to prioritize its immigration policies at a cost to the lives, safety, and health of our citizens. Many members of this committee signed a letter to the Appropriations Committee urging continued funding for FEMA's pre-disaster mitigation program. We must continue our efforts to provide sufficient funding and by reauthorization, reauthorizing this program. Finally, earlier this month, we saw a part of a highway collapse in Georgia. This incident reinforces the need to invest in infrastructure that is resilient to disasters, whether natural or man-made. As Congress moves toward uh, or moves forward on an infrastructure package, we must require any infrastructure constructed with federal dollars to be resilient and meet the latest building codes. It is necessary to have requirements like these so that we can actually reduce disaster costs and losses without merely shifting costs. <clears throat> I look forward to today's testimony and further ideas on action Congress can take to reduce disaster costs and losses, and I yield back. Thank you, Ranking Member Johnson. Uh, today we are joined by the Honorable W. Craig Fugate, was uh, FEMA's administrator from 2009 to January 2017. Uh, he transformed FEMA into a survivor-centric response organization and drove the delivery of disaster assistance in ways that are more efficient and reduce federal disaster costs. Administrator Fugate will share his thoughts about what can be done to reduce disaster damages, lower disaster spending, and protect FEMA's capabilities. The Honorable R. David Paulson was the FEMA administrator from 2005 until January 2009 and began uh, the restoration of FEMA in the wake of Hurricane Katrina. Administrator Paulson will talk about how we can change the nation's approach to mitigating disaster damage. Mr. Andrew Phelps, the Director of Oregon's Office of Emergency Management, who joins us to share some of the state's innovative mitigation practices and how they are, have leveraged federal investments to maximize community resiliency. Chief John Sinclair is the President and Chairman of the Board of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. Uh, Chief Sinclair is also an active fire chief in the state of Washington. Chief Sinclair will talk about the importance of pre-disaster mitigation and post-disaster mitigation and discuss some initiatives to protect infrastructure from future damage. And Mr. Mark Bervin is the President and Chief Operating Officer of Nationwide's Property and Casualty Operations. Mr. Bourbon is, is here on behalf of the Build Strong Coalition. Uh, Mr. Bourbon can inform us on some of the alarming trends in disaster costs and losses and some of the bold ways they are proposing to curb these costs and losses. I ask unanimous consent that our witnesses' full statements be included in the record without objection so ordered. For our witnesses, since your written testimony has been made as a part of the record, the subcommittee would request that you limit your oral testimony to five minutes. Administrator Fugate, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman Barletta and Ranking Member Johnson, as well as uh, Chairman Schuster and some of the other uh, folks, uh, representatives here. First thing I want to hit on is uh, something that uh, Chairman Schuster talked about as FEMA's role. Uh, FEMA's been in part of the Department of Homeland Security since its formation. And during that time, it's gone up and down as far as its availability to do its job. Congress clarified those roles with the Post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act, uh, dictating that the FEMA administrator must have experience uh, in the profession, that they are a person that reports to the president during disasters and is the principal advisor on these issues to the Homeland Security Council, the president, and others. Uh, we don't have a FEMA administrator. Um, I think that on the response side, the career folks will do an adequate job. They'll do good. But without a political person, as this administration continues to move form or forward, FEMA risks not being part of the policy discussions without the political leadership. So as we approach hurricane season, 
uh, if I remember correctly, my nomination and confirmation occurred by May 19th, uh, before the start of hurricane season. It may be symbolic, but I think the longer we go without the political leadership at FEMA, the greater the risk that they're not part of the policy discussions that set the agenda going forward. Uh, the second thing, uh, as, as you showed, Chairman Borrella, is the rising cost of disasters. Let's remind everybody, you know what that money pays for? Uninsured losses. Now, that's reasonable when you call out the National Guard or you're providing emergency food and sheltering. But I'll give you a recent example of one of these large disasters. Uh, the recent flooding in the state of Louisiana last fall. Just in individual assistance for people who did not have flood insurance, we paid out close to a billion dollars in the first 30 days just in individual assistance. It took us about three more days to get to that same figure in the state of New Jersey and uh, New York during Sandy. And it, we're seeing this across the board that at the local and state levels, more and more of uh, public buildings are self-insured, which means you're paying for that. Uh, we're seeing that for municipal or co-ops or government-backed utilities, you pay for that as well. But the private sector, you're not. So when we had all the hospitals impacted in New York, the majority of which were eligible entities as nonprofit or government-based, you spent a lot of money rebuilding uninsured losses. Now, that's the th key thing here. It was all uninsured. We don't pay for insured losses. Any investor-owned hospital in the same impact, though, would have gotten no assistance from FEMA, just like any utility that's investor-owned gets no assistance from FEMA, the taxpayer. It all goes for uninsured losses. So my first question is, why aren't we seeing more insurance on state and local buildings? And the answer is, our pain point is so low on disaster declarations that many governments make the calculated decision that they can go self-insured on small disasters, but if it's really big, you're going to come in at 75 cents on the dollar. So what we've done is we transferred a lot of risk to the federal taxpayer, underwriting risk at the local level, and it's a informed decision they're making. Without good codes and standards, uh, without insurability, those disaster costs are going to continue to climb, and they're climbing faster because the risk is changing. And what we have done as a nation set the pain point on risk so low, we're not changing behavior. So you're subsidizing development. You're subsidizing decision-making about risk. I'm not always sure that's done in the best interest of the taxpayer. So we began looking at disasters, and Mr. Chairman, you're absolutely right. If we took out all the small disasters, it doesn't really change the equation. It's the big ones. But we looked at something that would be an incentive to get more encouragement of good behavior. Because states like Oregon and others do a lot of work to buy down risk. Yet in the calculation of determining a disaster declaration, that's not recognized. While the Stafford Act says you look at a lot of different factors, the reality is the number one factor to determine a disaster declaration is the per capita cost, with no factor of what states do to buy down risk. And so the idea of creating a deductible is just like any insurance policy. I hardly know anybody that has car insurance or health insurance doesn't have a deductible. You got skin in the game. By creating a deductible, the idea was we would not go back to the first dollar as we currently do when they hit their thresholds. Now, that's not going to save a lot of money in big disasters. Excuse me. Can you pull the microphone a little bit closer? This is important. I'd like to hear yes. it. The idea of the deductible was we would not go back to the first dollar as we currently do. If you hit the threshold, and this is my state of Florida, I know it best, it's about $24 million is the threshold on public assistance. If we hit that threshold, we go back to the first dollar, 75% of that, 75 cents on the dollar. The idea of the deductible is we would not go back to that first dollar. We'd start probably around what their threshold is. So anything over $24 million, you would do the cost share. But below that, the state would have the full amount. Now, states will rightfully tell you, and this is their position, that we're transferring it back to the states. And I'm like, well, under the Constitution, it was yours in the first place. It's up to the discretion of the president to even declare a disaster. So let's get past that we're transferring risk back. It's actually the responsibility of state and local governments to do this. The federal government is there when it exceeds their capabilities. That's what the law says, exceeds their capabilities. So under the proposed deductible, what we want to do is give credits to state like Oregon. So whatever their deductible is, because they do so much work in mitigation, and we say we get a dollar savings for every, or four dollar savings for every dollar invest, if they're investing a state dollar in mitigation, they ought to buy down four dollars of their deductible. And the idea would be you got strong codes in land use, you do things to buy down risk, it lowers your deductible. You could probably get to zero. Now, as the chairman points out on small disasters, that won't save money. But over time, it will start changing and incentivizing states that are taking steps to buy down the risk 
and we'll see that trend. If you go to FEMA.gov and you look at disasters by states, you'll find some of the states with the most frequent disasters are also proud of the fact they have hardly any red tape or barriers to building and constructing in high-risk areas. Why? Because you, the taxpayer, are underwriting that risk, and every dollar you spend on that is uninsured. So this last piece of that is we have got to tighten up the insurance requirements. You build it back, you carry insurance. We should not be rebuilding buildings three, four, five times, as we've seen, and you're paying again because they weren't carrying insurance. So this is a, a way to move forward, Mr. Chairman. It addresses your issues. Uh, there will be pain. There will be change. But we have to remember, we got a built infrastructure that we got to figure out how to take care of, improve, and people's lives are at stake. And we should not single out individuals for punitive, we're not helping. But state and local governments need to have better incentives to change their behavior, or those disaster costs will continue to climb. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Administrator Paulson, uh, you may proceed. Uh, Chairman Barletta, Ranking Member Johnson, and the uh, distinguished members of the committee, uh, I'd like to thank you for holding what I consider a very important uh, uh, meeting today. We're going to be talking about the building a 21st century infrastructure in America. Specifically, I want to address how we can mitigate damage, recover quickly from disasters, and I'm very grateful for the leadership of the Chairman and the Ranking Member and the members of this committee, and I'm willing to assist any way that I can. Uh, in no uncertain terms, I want to impress on the committee today that we have a moment, we have a moment right now, to make America resilient again and save both lives and taxpayer dollars. In my 35 years experience dealing with natural disasters at the federal, state, and local level, including my service as FEMA Administrator, as you pointed out, I can tell you our federal policy regarding disasters does not nearly do enough to prevent infrastructure failure before the disaster strikes. My position is largely influenced by experiencing firsthand the aftermath of multiple catastrophic events. I've seen homes and businesses destroyed because they were never built to withstand the natural disasters that would inevitably come, or in some cases because building codes that would have fortified these structures were simply were not enforced. This has become a reality of our nation's current disaster policy. A disaster strikes, homes are destroyed, we spend billions to rebuild, and when the next, strikes, the next disaster strikes, the homes fail again. This method wastes billions and even worse, lives that are unnecessarily lost. To break the existing cycle of destruction and recovery, the U.S. must adopt a proactive system that focuses on protecting the nation from the rising frequency of major disasters. So I've given, I'm going to give you four game-changing ideas that I believe will make America resilient again and save billions of dollars and perhaps countless lives. First, we must get serious about states to ensure and improve mitigation plans and adopt and enforce statewide building codes. The fact that the federal government continues to have massive fiscal exposure in high-risk areas in part because states are either not adopting appropriate building codes or they are not enforcing the codes. That's why we should tie federal money for disaster assistance directly to the decisions by the states in preparing for disasters. Today, the federal minimum cost share following an actual disaster, as it was pointed out, is 75%. The committee should look at rewarding states that improve resiliency by increasing their cost share to maybe 80 percent. Conversely, the committee should lower the federal cost share to, let's say, 60 percent for states that fail to approve, adopt, or enforce mitigation plans or building codes. This action will force states to work with fewer federal dollars if they continue to shirk their responsibilities on the state and local levels in order to ensure the homes are built to code. Secondly. The FEMA pre-disaster mitigation programs are incredibly small compared to the massive amount of post-disaster money that flows to Congress. Post-disaster spending swamps pre-disaster mitigation spending at a ratio of 1 to 14. That must change if we're going to reduce the cost of disasters and money and lives. We should use a dedicated portion of the total annual money spent in the Disaster Relief Fund and allocate it towards a new hazard mitigation grant program. This new program would be funded with existing DRF funds, not a new appropriation, and would force the federal government to fund nationwide mitigation programs. A national hazard mitigation program could operate like the hazard mitigation grant program, except funds would be available nationwide with that regard to whether a disaster has occurred. Third, the federal government should do everything possible to encourage resilient building codes, especially in areas where disasters already occurred. Right now, we do very little. If a disaster state has not fortified correctly, we should try to take some positive out of the event occurring by making sure the state has the opportunity to fix its oversight. Funding should be available as essential assistance for development and enactment of statewide building codes for two years after disaster strikes. These funds will be used to defray costs associated with development and enforcement of statewide building codes, and it would accelerate recovery also. And fourthly, 
the federal government currently has a reactor response to disasters. This caused a large flow of money to come to many different agencies in a short window, resulting in a lack of accountability to the taxpayer. We can actually reduce disaster spending by consolidating ad hoc federal disaster assistance programs under FEMA. FEMA, in consultation with other agencies, would publish a list of programs that would be transferred and to administered by FEMA. I suggest we also require FEMA administrated projects to meet cost benefit standards, be directly related to disaster damages, and be coordinated with other disaster mitigation measures. My 35 years in working in emergency preparedness tells me that we simply, we simply are not doing enough. There is no excuse not to demand the states enforce building codes when it's the federal taxpayer who must foot the bill. Federal policymakers must stop this terrible deal for the taxpayer and help make America resilient. These measures will save lives and save taxpayer dollars. They will enforce states that are not achieving a level of efficiency in the structures to either improve or lose access to millions of dollars in disaster relief. And I encourage the committee to take this opportunity to act. I want to thank you. I look forward to continuing to work with this committee on this, what I consider a very important issue. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your testimony, Administrator Paulson. Uh, Mr. Phelps, you may proceed. Uh, thank you, Chairman Barletta, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of this sub subcommittee for holding this hearing today. As stated, my name is Andrew Phelps, and I am the Director of the Oregon Military Department's Office of Emergency Management, and I'm pleased to be here to bring a state perspective to this important discussion of hazard mitigation. I was working as an actor in New York City when I found myself on the roof of my East Village apartment in Manhattan a few minutes before 9 o'clock in the morning on September 11th, 2001, watching one of the World Trade Center towers burn. Moments later, an airplane appeared on the horizon, flew towards Manhattan, disappeared behind the second tower, and emerged from the other side in a ball of flame. Until that time, I hadn't even taken so much as a first aid class. That moment changed me as it changed so many others in so many different ways. I never wanted to experience something like that again and began working towards a career aimed at preventing the impacts of disasters. Over the past 15 years, I've come to accept that we cannot eliminate every hazard. But what compels me to do the work that I and my colleagues in the great state of Oregon do every day is the belief that the role of an emergency manager is to prevent hazards from becoming disasters. Through collaborative partnerships among community groups, nonprofits, the private sector, cities, counties, tribal, state, and federal government, we have spent millions of dollars in Oregon in often innovative mitigation projects that have in turn saved tens of millions of dollars in disaster damages and an incalculable number of lives. It is my hope that all of the testimony shared today will help illuminate the side of emergency management that seldom makes headlines because well, it's just not exciting to talk about what did not happen in the disaster that was prevented. Oregon has a long history of leveraging federal mitigation funds, regardless of the program or hazard, to reduce the negative consequences of when the water flows, when the ground moves, or the wind blows. A prime example of the importance of mitigation in Oregon comes from the 2007 flood that ravaged the city of Vernonia outside of Portland. Oregon leveraged $23 million in federal mitigation funds and addition of millions of local and state dollars to reduce that community's ongoing flood risk. In December 2015, the Portland metro area saw historic rains and a storm similar to the 2007 event, but little damage occurred in Vernonia, which the city administrator attributed in large part to the mitigation efforts of the previous eight years. As this subcommittee examines the federal mitigation grant programs, I encourage you to look at those areas where more work is needed like the catastrophic wildfires that have become commonplace in the Western United States and are becoming more prevalent in other parts of the country. In 2015, FEMA announced a pilot project to provide hazard mitigation grant program funds for wildfires receiving fire management assistance grant declarations. Oregon received around $2.5 million through that program due to the particularly bad wildfire season we had experienced. A similar program was not funded in 2016, yet I remain hopeful we can learn from the 2015 pilot to address this critical gap and fund wildfire-specific mitigation. Another area in desperate need for resources is earthquake mitigation. Oregon, like many states, is accustomed to the moderate quake. However, Oregon, California, and my friends in Washington face an entirely different threat. Given my impetus for pursuing what has become my passion, emergency management, I make it a point to regularly review the 9-11 Commission report. And one chapter always jumps out at me. Chapter 8, the system was blinking red. That chapter discusses the many warning signs before those attacks that were unable to be capitalized upon to stop that threat. In Oregon, in the Pacific Northwest, the threat of Cascadia is blinking red. The Cascadia subduction zone fault runs from Northern California to British Columbia, Canada, and has a well-documented history of generating 9.0 magnitude quakes 
resulting in up to five minutes of strenuous, intense shaking, followed almost immediately by tsunami waves reaching 50 feet in height or higher. Oregon has effectively used federal dollars towards education, outreach, and research programs, and tens of millions of dollars in state and local funds to mitigate this threat through initiatives like the Oregon Seismic Rehabilitation Grant Program. But more work and help is needed. A Cascadia event highlights the urgency for strong collaborative engagement across public bodies and with non-governmental partners. For example, Oregon and the city of Portland received over half a million dollars in federal pre-disaster mitigation grant funds for a public-private partnership to seismically retrofit homes owned by predominantly low-income earners. The federal dollars were effectively doubled when homeowners put up half the costs for retrofits that secured their homes' frames to their foundations. Now, be it tornadoes, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes, or fires, government cannot engineer their way out of hazards. However, we can armor up our infrastructure, take personal actions to prepare, and provide our citizens with the tools they need to educate themselves about the threat and be alerted when one is imminent. Thank you all for the opportunity to be here today and speak. Thank you for your testimony, Mr. Phelps. Uh, Chief Sinclair, you may proceed. Good morning, Chairman Barletta, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the committee. <clears throat> My name is John Sinclair, and I'm the Fire Chief and Emergency Manager for Kittitas Valley Fire and Rescue in Ellensburg, Washington. I'm also the President and Chairman of the Board of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. The IFC represents approximately uh, 12,000 leaders of the nation's fire, rescue, and emergency services. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the importance of mitigating, of mitigating damage and recovering quickly from disasters. Every disaster starts at a local level. The local fire department usually is the first, is the first agency to respond on scene during an incident and the last to leave. It is an all-hazards response force that must be prepared to a variety of missions. From the national response perspective, there are no national or state fire departments. When a disaster or national emergency strikes, the nation replies, relies on local fire departments to provide service to the stricken communities. The IFC is concerned by the increasing number of disasters in the United States. Between 1960 and 1969, the average number of disaster declarations was approximately 19 per year. Between 2010 and 2014, this number skyrocketed to 67 per year, with a record 99 major disaster declarations in 2011. In addition, the cost of these disasters are increasing. Between 2009 and 2012, the average annual cost of federal wildland fire suppression operations was $1.25 billion. For the following four years, the average annual cost increased by 32% to $1.84 billion. The nation must develop a comprehensive strategy for addressing this problem. The strategy must highlight the importance of investing in pre-disaster mitigation, ensuring an effective emergency response, and authorizing critical post-disaster mitigation. Mitigation is a vital component to any comprehensive strategy. As Ben Franklin said, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. The IFC recommends that states adopt model residential and commercial building and fire codes. These codes are developed using a consensus-driven process. All interested stakeholders are included with the intent to construct safer buildings. Scientific research has clearly demonstrated that the adoption of building codes saves lives and reduces property damage. The IFC also recommends the adoption of community preparedness programs. The IFC's Ready, Set, Go program is a cooperative program with the U.S. Fire Service, with the U.S. Forest Service. Through community outreach and education, it helps communities mitigate the risk of wildland fires. The program educates individuals about the need to be situationally aware, to plan ahead, to evacuate in the case of a major fire. These preparations for wildland fires through the Ready, Set, Go program helps communities prepare for other hazards as well. An effective emergency response is another key to reducing the damage from a disaster or emergency. For example, the sooner a wildland fire is extinguished, the less damage it can do. Experienced leadership is significant for an effective response. The IFC recommends that the administration appoint an experienced leader to be the FEMA Administrator, the U.S. Fire Administrator, and other leadership's positions within FEMA. The IFC also asked Congress to ensure that the continued development of future fire and EMS leaders 
by reauthorizing the U.S. Fire Administration. The USFA's National Fire Academy is the premier fire and EMS leadership institute. It provides leadership training and education for the next generation of emergency managers. Local fire and EMS departments are part of the backbone of the national preparedness system. As such, the IFC asked Congress to reauthorize the fire and safety and safer grant programs. These merit-based matching grants help local fire departments meet their staffing equipment and training needs. A fire department must have effective day-to-day -day operations to be able to provide assistance in national disasters. We also ask that Congress continue to support the State Homeland Security and UASI grant programs. These programs incentivize federal, state, and local law enforcement, fire, EMS, emergency management, and public health, the whole community, to plan and train together. This planning and training is crucial for an effective all-hazard response. We also want to thank the committee for its support of the uh, USAR system, which is an effective uh, federal-local partnership. The IFC also thanks the committee for its focus on post-disaster mitigation. Effective post-disaster mitigation can prevent future disasters. For this reason, we support H.R. 1183, the Wildfire Prevention Act. This legislation allows jurisdictions that receive FMAG grants to receive hazard mitigation assistance as well. I want to thank the committee for the opportunity to discuss the need to address the rising number and cost of disasters by focusing on pre- and post-disaster mitigation, community preparedness, effective emergency response, we can begin to address this problem in a comprehensive fashion. This work will, re this work will require cooperation at the federal, state, and local levels. Learning from the tragedies of 9-11 and Hurricane Katrina, the federal government has made strategic investments to improve the nation's capability to prepare and respond to all hazards. We recommend that Congress continue to support these efforts to keep America safe. Thank you very much. Thank you for your testimony, Chief Sinclair. Mr. Bourbon, you may proceed. Chairman Barletta, Ranking Member Johnson, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Mark Bourbon. I'm the President and Chief Operating Officer of a Nationwide Mutual Insurance Company. Over the past 91 years, Nationwide has grown from a small mutual auto insurer owned by our members to one of the largest insurance and financial financial service companies in the world. We offer our members a full range of insurance products and financial services and are the nation's leading insurer of small businesses, farms, and among the leaders in auto and property insurance. Nationwide has been a member of the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies since our inception, and I currently serve on the board of directors. Both NAMIC and Nationwide are founding and executive committee members of the Build Strong Coalition, on whose behalf I am testifying today. The Build Strong Coalition was created in 2011 and is committed to the building, building the nation's homes and businesses more resiliently. The coalition salutes you, Chairman Barletta, for seeking ways to reduce federal disaster losses. We share your serious concerns surrounding the federal government's current approach to pre-disaster mitigation, which has failed to provide communities and individuals across the nation with the tools they need to prepare for the next storm. Natural catastrophes are increasing in frequency and severity at an alarming rate, as we've discussed. Between 1976 and 1995, there were an average of 39 federal disaster declarations per year. This number skyrocketed to an average of 121 between 1996 and 2015. During that time, we saw the country hit by Hurricane Katrina and Superstorm Sandy. And just last year, the U.S. experienced the second highest number of billion dollar weather events ever recorded, including devastating flooding in Louisiana and in the Southeast following Hurricane Matthew. Research has shown time and again that pre-disaster mitigation is our best line of defense in a time where we face more severe catastrophes. Through the groundbreaking research of the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, we know that the IBHS Fortified Home Program is proven to help strengthen homes from hurricanes, wildfire, high winds, and hail. By simulating real-world disaster conditions at their state-of-the-art facility, the IBHS has proven that even small things, the way in which a door swings, the size of a roofing nail, can have a major impact in surviving a natural catastrophe. But despite knowing the power of resilient building and pre-disaster mitigation, the federal government continues to take a reactive posture waiting for a disaster to strike. 
From 2004 to 2013, FEMA spent a massive 89 times more on post-disaster assistance than pre-disaster mitigation. Certainly, victims should get the help they need to get back on their feet in the aftermath of a disaster. But the fact that we invest such a small amount to prepare communities for severe disasters is further evidence that we need a wholesale change in FEMA's approach. Now is the time to focus on protecting our homes, businesses, and communities. And since we know the most effective way to shield lives and property during a disaster is resilient construction, the Build Strong Coalition is calling on President Trump and Congress to take a multi-pronged approach to strengthening how we build in this country. First, we are seeking a critical reform designed to encourage states to exit the cycle of destruction. This can be accomplished by creating a powerful incentive of additional post-disaster funding for states that adopt and enforce strong building codes. Second, we should shift some of the federal resources from reactive post-disaster spending to proactive mitigation investments in our communities. One of the most effective ways we can make this shift is by creating a new National Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. This new program could be funded with 10% of the amount already allocated to the existing post-disaster hazard mitigation grant program and could be used by communities to protect homes, businesses, and to mitigate risks before disaster strikes. At Nationwide, part of our commitment to our members is to help them prevent losses. When our members are victims of natural disasters, we see the tragic impact, the loss of loved ones, the emotional distress of seeing everything that someone owns gone in a minute, and the loss of a sense of security. It doesn't have to be this way, and it shouldn't be this way. As Congress and the President work together to improve our nation's infrastructure, we urge you to adopt a national strategy for investing in pre-disaster mitigation that will save lives, property, and billions in taxpayer, taxpayer dollars. Thank you again for the opportunity to present at today's hearing and for this important work. Thank you for your testimony. I'll now begin the first round of questions, limited to five minutes for each member. If there are any additional questions following the first round, we'll have additional rounds of questions as needed. Uh, Mr. Bourbon, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, the, the data is clear. Uh, a small number of very large disasters make up almost all disaster spending. What is it about these disasters that cost so much? And what, if anything, could reduce those costs? It's a great question, and, and you're absolutely correct. You know, as we look at what are driving some of the factors of the cost of the losses today, we see a lot of things coming together. First, it's a product of a successful society. You know, Americans are building bigger homes, uh, larger commercial structures. Uh, residential development in uh, high-risk coastal areas has skyrocketed. For instance, today the U.S. has over $10 trillion worth of property in coastal high-risk areas. Um, it's easy to see that historically, as we would look at a storm that would come in, that same storm today would cost significantly more because of the infrastructure that's in existence within these locations of high risk. Uh, so a number of things contribute. In addition, I think the comments that were made earlier about uh, what academics would call the moral hazard that we have, essentially when people and businesses figure out that um, uninsured properties uh, at the time of a post-disaster will receive recovery from the federal government. It lowers the incentive of insurance and other ways that we could save dollars that the federal government would not need to spend. Mitigation strategies, as we discussed, research at the IBHS uh, with scientific information that easily can improve the sustainability of homes and properties is a critical element to improve that. Thank you. Administrator Paulson, the key to reducing disaster costs seems to be reducing damage. Uh, when physical damage is high, large numbers of people are displaced. The local, local economy is crushed and reconstruction costs soar. What do you think are the appropriate roles of the federal government, the state, and local governments with respect to reducing disaster damages? That's another good question. <laughs> uh, I, I firmly believe that in, in statewide building codes, that we have to put model codes out there that are going to build the homes and our businesses based on the disasters that are going to be there. Uh, we did that very clearly after Hurricane Andrew in South Florida and through our state. We changed or we saw what the damage was. Homes that failed or should not have failed. 
And, uh, and we changed our building codes to mitigate that. And now we get some of these same storms come through and they're, they're not gonna fail. So I think that's the state's responsibility to have those codes and enforce the codes. Uh, as the federal government's responsibility is to hold the states accountable. I talked about the carrot and stick uh, uh, method. I think that's very important. You have to have a strong carrot and a strong stick. If you do this, we're gonna help you. If you don't do this, you're, you're, gonna, you're gonna be on your own for part of that. So I think those are the issues we have to look at. Make sure the codes are, the codes are there, the codes are enforced. We have mitigation plans in place and the federal government has to, has to be the, the parent in this particular issue. Administrator Fugate, you proposed the disaster deductible as a means to encourage states to take steps to lower disaster costs over time and improve their own emergency management uh, capabilities. And Administrator Paulson, you proposed adjusting federal disaster cost shares in order to accomplish uh, a similar purpose. Could both of you explain why you believe these proposals are important and how they would work? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll start with the deductible. You know, what I've found is the political realities, if we come in with too heavy of a stick in the aftermath of the disaster, there's not the political will to hold fast. You want to help people. A deductible is a lower threshold, less painful, because in many cases, their deductible they would have been paying for if they hadn't reached their thresholds to get declared. So it's not such an egregious amount that it makes it difficult to recover. But it's surprising that those dollar figures will get the attention of state legislatures because they run balanced budgets and suddenly coming up with tens of millions of dollars in a disaster that didn't reach that threshold or they had a deductible is a forcing mechanism that I think is politically sustainable. So I'm always, you know, I'm always a realist. There are the absolute things we should be doing, and then after a disaster, there's the political reality that we as a nation are going to help our neighbors. We're not going to let survivors suffer because of decisions state and local governments did or didn't make. So I always look at it from the standpoint, if you set the price too high, the political pain, it's hard to enforce that after a big disaster. And that's why I looked at a deductible more along things that people are used to that you can budget for and understand. Um, and I think that would be a way to do it. You know, uh, Director Paulson's uh, you know, idea about adjusting uh, cost share, that would be another tool, but I would also remind you, anything under 75% would require legislative action. That is set in law by the Stafford Act. Now, Administrator Fugate is correct. It is, it is, it is gonna require legislative action, but that's what you do. Uh, so uh, you have to be able to reward the states and give them an incentive to put the mitigation plans in place, to put statewide building codes in place. Uh, if we don't do that, we're gonna end up even if we have a deductible, I think we're gonna end up with states not doing what they should be doing. Uh, and I think if we do the reward, make it 60, make it 80% uh, if you're doing the right thing, and make it 60% if you're not doing the right thing. And that'll encourage states to put those things in place because they're not that expensive for a state to do that. Thank you. Uh, chair now recognizes Ranking Member Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fugate. Uh, the state of Georgia has submitted comments on FEMA's proposed disaster deductible, arguing that it creates additional administrative burdens on state government. As a proponent of the disaster deductible, um, can you shed light on uh, whether or not uh, there's an undue burden placed on uh, state governments? Well, if I'm state government, anytime the federal government wants to do something different, I always say it's an unfunded or unfunded mandate or a burden. I think we've got to be realistic here. It will require us working together. And there would be additional processes built into it. It's going to be hard just to say an absolute uh, deductible if we are also trying to give states credit for the things they're doing to buy down that risk. Um, knowing how things work up here, it could very easily become a bureaucratic burden. But I also think that if we work together, we can get to a better answer working as a team. But just saying it's going to cause more problems or more regulations is another way of saying we just don't want to do it. And as I've told the states, I said, you may not like my idea, but you better have an alternative because the next time this Congress has to face a $60 billion supplemental, things may change. They did not participate in. And so my response is work with FEMA on that to build a system that works. If you don't like the answer, come up with another solution and just don't say we don't like what you're doing. Because again, I think that the cost of disasters needs to be addressed and states need to be part of that conversation. Thank you. Anyone else have a comment they'd like to make on that issue? 
All right. Uh, Mr. Fugate, you discussed the statutorily defined qualifications and experience that the FEMA administration, ex administrator is required to meet. The International Association of Fire Chiefs has proposed that the deputy administrator and assistant administrators meet similar requirements. Do you have any thoughts on that? Again, it would be uh, uh, something I could support. I think it would be, uh, if, you, if you look at the Post-Katrina Emergency Management Reform Act, it's in there for the administrator and for the regional administrators. And since we've moved a lot of our regional administrators to career positions, there's fewer political positions left. But I think if you built that in, uh, in many cases, you look at the deputies, your chief operating officer. Uh, again, you want people that have experience, but you also want people, and this is, I, I always caution people, it's real easy to say you got to do this to the administration. But it's also important that the administration has their people in there because if they don't go to those people, don't trust those people, they'll bypass FEMA. So it's important to have the qualifications, but not be so prescriptive that we take away any administration's responsibility to pick their team and the people that they're going to go to in a crisis. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Paulison, under your reduced cost share proposal, how many states do you estimate would have higher cost shares and how many states would have lower cost shares? <clears throat> I, don't, uh, I don't have that figure. I do know that there are only 16 states that are, have enforceable statewide building codes. Uh, we have pockets of building codes in some of the major cities, but as far as statewide building codes, I believe the number is right around 16. So there's a lot of work to do. Uh, but I do agree with Mr. Fugate, it's things we have to work together on of how do, we get, how do we get from A to B to make sure everybody's on the same page, and I think we can do that. Uh, but uh, if we don't do something to incentivize states or to punish states who do not do this, we're going to be back right where we were. We, time after time, we rebuild homes, and the next time a storm comes along, whether it's a, an earthquake or a flood or winds, they, they blow down again, they're destroyed again. And we can't continue doing that. It's, it, it's simply not sustainable as far as fiscally uh, how uh, way we're doing things. We have to stop, take a deep, deep breath. What can we do to fix this? And that's one recommendation you know, I put on the table that we need to really look at. All right. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Smucker for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Fiergate, if I understand your testimony correctly, you believe that we have not achieved a proper balance of risk share, which drives behaviors uh, so states and other uh, impacted uh, jurisdictions are not providing proper mitigation and, in fact, you said uh, are not even insured in some cases. So I wanted to understand that a little more. Who is it that is not insured for loss? State and local governments. And, um, and that's the bulk of what you're paying out. Individual assistance, you're basically paying out for uh, people who don't have flood insurance and some people that are underinsured or not covered. But the bulk of your public assistance dollars, uh, you're picking up debris, you're fixing roads and stuff. I don't think I'd really focus on insuring that. But um, in the city of New York, of the nine hospitals and hospital roads, eight of those got billions of dollars of taxpayers' money to pay for imaging equipment, damages, and other losses that they did not have insurance on. So what you're saying is insurance is currently available for state and local governments to yes, cover sir. It's loss. Yes, available but, to the private sector. But they're choosing not to insure because they believe the federal government will come in. What they do in many cases is they do what they call self-insurance, but it's not really self-insurance, not actually based. Uh, they'll cover their reoccurring and routine losses and exposures but then they'll state that either insurance wasn't available or not affordable. Do, do we have statistics? I'm sorry, I'm rushing you a little, but do we have statistics uh, regarding uh, uh, state and local insurance uh, or, or jurisdiction, how many are insured and how many are not? What we tend to find is uh, uh, discovery learning. We learn about it after they get hit, and then they come forward with their claims. Uh, and sometimes those decisions are made recently. Others are longstanding practices. And I've had the situation in some states where, for example, school districts, one school district is fully insured, the school district next to it self-insured, we're paying for that. I was in Arkansas, and it's kind of bad when it's in your term it happens. Um, it got, school got destroyed in 2010 in Arkansas, wasn't insured, self-insured. We paid for the entire replacement of that school at 75 percent. In 2014, it got hit by another tornado, flattened again. The only reason why the taxpayer didn't pay for it, the construction company hadn't turned it over to the school district, and it was still under their insurance. But if that school had been built 
30 days earlier, you'd have paid for that school twice. Thank you. I'm going to uh, change directions. Mr. Paulson and Mr. Bourbon, you, you had both uh, referenced statewide building codes. Um, I have a background in construction and also in the state Senate in Pennsylvania did considerable work on uh, the statewide building code there. Um, and I fully understand the need to uh, implement standards that um, mitigate risk. Um, there's another side to it, and I'd just like to get your perspective, and that is each of those standards can add cost to construction. And speaking for uh, PA 16, my area, one of our major problems is affordable housing. Um, and so if we add too much cost to construction, we literally impact the quality of life for individuals because they may not afford the home. And so, um, you know, obviously at some point it's uh, inefficient. Um, and so I guess I'd, I'd just like to, um, while I support a, a strong building code, um, I'd like to get your perspective on uh, achieving that balance. I'll take the first crack. Uh, well, first, I've got a background in construction also. I was a state licensed general contractor. And uh, um, it does add a, a cost to the, uh, building a home but it's not significant enough to put it out of the price range of people buying the homes. Sometimes it's as simple as how many nails you put in the roof. Uh, so there's minimal cost there. I mean, we change our building codes to, you can't use press board on the roof, you gotta use plywood, it's gotta be five eighths, you know, th three inches on, on, the, on the seam, six inches in the field, and the ring shank nails. So it's a couple hundred bucks for the roof, uh, and, that, and we find that, that now that roof doesn't come off. Uh, making sure how you fasten the windows in uh, into instead of into the wood bucket goes into the concrete. Uh, you know we we, we built CBS down there, and it's, it's things like that. It it doesn't add a big cost, uh, but it protects the envelope of the home. So it, it doesn't you know the do the it, doors coming into that have to swing out in South Florida, because we found out Hurricane Andrew if the doors that swung in blew in, and then once you get wind in the house the roof comes off from the inside out. So it's a simple thing. So there's no cost to that. It's just which right. way you swing the door. So the builders will tell you, yes, it you know, runs the cost up, and the truth is it does not run the cost up that much. And then you don't have to rebuild the home twice like Mr. Fugue said. I wonder if, wonder if Mr. Bourbon would, could answer that as well. You bet. And I thought it was a great response. You know, it, it is a very important issue of this. I think one of the things that the Build Strong Coalition that we've looked at, one of the four elements that we really see as being core of what we're doing here is creating a federal incentive for extra post-disaster funding that could be utilized for pre-disaster mitigation to address and could be administered appropriately to make sure that the proper funding goes to alleviate some of those affordability concerns. I think that there are also things that, while not in the construction trade, uh, from the insurance trade, from the private sector piece, that uh, the incentive to continue to find ways to assist in the affordability and incentivize through insurance uh, transactions also exists. Nationwide is uh, trying some of that today because, again, of the mutual heritage investing for the longer term. We believe that there is an opportunity to continue through a private piece to provide incentive on the insurance transaction, both from potentially the construction, the contractor side, as well as the individual homeowner, uh, that there is kind of that joint opportunity both through the incentive in post-disaster shifting that funding, um, uh, as well as private solution. Mr. Chairman, do I have time for another question, or are we moving on? We're gonna have another round. We'll okay, thank you very much. Sure. Uh, chair recognizes Ms. Norton for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate uh, this uh, hearing, particularly uh, at this time. Um, Pre-disaster mitigation has been a uh, bipartisan favorite <laughs> of this committee, uh, and yet uh, we've never been able to convince any administration to, 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 to uh, on, on the three-to-one savings uh, because that's not how the appropriation process works. <laughs> uh, and we tend to matters after the, after the fact, which is, of course, the most costly way uh, to, uh, to, 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 to treat them. My, um, as far as I'm concerned, there's an elephant in this hearing room. Uh, I'm interested in 
unanticipated disasters, uh, which we are increasingly seeing around the country and around the world. Um, I think the chairman quoted and the uh, statistics from the CRS, 25% or so of the disasters account for 92% of the cost. One wonders how long those figures will remain what, where, where they are. For example, there are unheard of disasters in places unseen before, and the intensity of disasters has shocked the nation. I mean, who would have expected uh, Hurricane Sandy <laughs> uh, to take out whole sections of New York City and New Jersey in, in the way uh, it did? Um, <coughs> we're seeing uh, we're seeing climate disasters of the kind that were never had in that particular region uh, before. Uh, in North America we see five times weather-related events over the prior three decades. I don't think any weatherman told us all of these things were coming down the road. Um, so I don't care where, where people are on climate change. The science is pretty clear on that. I am concerned with whether we are prepared to deal with increasingly unanticipated and intense uh, climate events. Now, Chief Sinclair, for example, uh, says in his testimony, comments on the increasing number of disasters, increasing number of disasters in the United States. Um, and quotes from the, 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 the nine years from 60 to 69, there were 19 uh, per year, escalated to 67 per year from 2010 to 2014. Something's happening. Um, he also speaks in his testimony, I'm looking at page two, about the intensity and costs. And so when I refer to Sinclair, for example, it, it was the intensity that, uh, that, that drove these matters. So I, I, I need to know whether this panel believes that the country is ready for anticipate, unanticipated disasters of far greater intensity than we have ever seen before. Mr. Fugit, I'd like to go down the line. Are you ready for that? Uh, all this talk about pre-disaster mitigation, <laughs> that's based on the disasters we have seen. I'm now talking about the disasters we are seeing. So could I have your response to the new, the intensity and the new dis disasters in places that they have not been seen before? Uh, yes, ma'am. Climate change is real, and I'm going to tell you how real it is. Insurance companies generally don't get into debates about public policy like that, but there is a recent article in Bloomberg that Traveler's Insurance is now tracking tornado impacts in their tornado seasons and they're seeing a climatic signal in their losses that is not sustainable. When insurance companies start telling you that the weather is changing more than they can compensate for and what their rates are, they're going to do one of two things. They're either going to increase their rates to become more affordable, shifting that to the taxpayer, or they're going to stop writing policies, shift it to the taxpayer. You have to build back, not by past data. It's not good enough. It doesn't tell us what's about to happen. And we really need to drive this conversation by what is insurable. And a simple answer may be, if the private sector doesn't think it's a good bet over 20 to 30 years and won't insure it at affordable rates, maybe we're not building in the right place the right way. But our past history of weather data is too insignificant to continue to use only that to determine what we should be building to. And in time and time again, when we've used that data, right after it, another event occurs and takes it out again and they didn't have insurance. Thank you. Mr. Paulson? I think regardless of uh, whether a climate change believer or not, it's building our, building our homes, building our businesses, uh, our public structures to withstand whatever type of disaster is going to be in that area. Uh, if you're in California, you build to earthquakes. 
uh, or you build a wildfire. You have a sustainable space around your house. You can't have a wood shingle roof anymore. Uh, in South Florida, we, did, we build our homes to withstand hurricanes. We know we're going to get 150 mile in our winds and we design our homes to, to deal with that. So if we, I think if we start looking at that part of it, being very pragmatic uh, and saying, okay, we need to, instead of our home being blown down every time, why did it blow down? You know, or why did it flood? Or why did it catch on fire from a wildfire? And, and let's build our homes to withstand those types of things. So regardless of how many come along or how intense they get, uh, every time we have damage, let's step back and say, okay, why did it have damage? What can we do to, fit, to mitigate that? I think that's the approach we need to take. Mr. Phelps. Thank you, Congressman Norton, for the question. Uh, <clears throat> speaking from Oregon's perspective, certainly we've seen increases in, in all types of weather and, and catastrophic wildfires has been a particularly big issue for us. Uh, we in emergency management often find ourselves in the business of consequence management. Uh, not quite as concerned or uh, have less control over why the wildfires are starting so frequently and burning so hot and in such large areas as how we can prevent those uh, fires from burning, uh, quickly extinguish them, and probably most importantly, prevent the loss of lives and property uh, in those fires. So uh, Oregon's perspective, we take an all-hazards approach to, to how we prepare and mitigate against disasters. We've got rugged coastline, agricultural valleys, uh, alpine mountains, and high desert. It's a big task to look at that hazard profile and try to find an effective statewide mitigation strategy to do so. Uh, but the work that we're doing at the state, and probably more importantly, the work of our counties and tribal governments in their areas uh, is, is more valuable at buying down some of that risk. With your indulgence, Mr. Chairman, could I get the, the, the next two, the, their responses to, to this one question I asked? Uh, Mr. Sinclair. Um, thank you very much for the question. Um, we currently have a 40,000 acre fire burning today in Arizona. Uh, the Okefenokee Swamp is in the process of burning. Um, wildland season used to be about an 85 day. It is now 365 days. Um, when you take a look at the intending, um, over, if you take a look over the next 20 years, um, it has typically been in the Intermountain West where the major fire problems have been. Uh, the scientists tell us that that fire problem is gonna go across the uh, hardwoods of the Plain States up in um, the Great Lakes region all the way into the Mid-Atlantic and into the New England states. Last year we saw disastrous fires uh, occur in Kentucky and Georgia um, at a time when we wouldn't have done that. The answer to your question is, are we ready? Um, it depends on the community. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at is that in the Intermountain West, we're educating the communities as it relates to defensible space, fire adaptive communities, uh, the Ready, Set, Go program. If there's anything that um, CNN, MSNBC will teach us is that every community across this great land needs to be prepared for the wildland problem. And so are we there yet? No. Uh, that is the reason why we need the codes. It is the reason why we need uh, to have a very open dialogue about where we're building uh, buildings and what we can do to make them fire resistant. It is also vital that because every one of those buildings is gonna have people in it and making sure that people are prepared to, for all types of hazards. Whether or not it's a wildland fire, whether it's a tornado, whether or not it's an earthquake, we need to make sure that we've got resilient communities and continue to Thank educate. Thank you, Mr. Sinclair. I'd get especially from the insurer, I'd like to get a final response. Yeah, thank you very much. It's a great question, and we spend our time from the insurance sector trying to expect the unexpected and build for that. And um, I think in the testimony that I provided, as we talked about the scientific research at the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, the one thing that we know is that the unexpected is gonna continue. And it's gonna continue to rise as we talked about the frequency and severity. So the core for us is about investing in scientific research about what we can do to mitigate the unexpected losses that are coming. Many folks have seen the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety where cars are crashed and think about the decades that that work has gone on to improve safety on our roadways. That same effort is being aggressively applied to the property side now at the Institute uh, for uh, uh, business and home safety. And we believe that the building codes and the research that we're finding will help us mitigate loss that will occur because we know that these trends are gonna continue. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate your indulgence. 
Thank you. Chair recognizes Mr. Weber for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I live on the Gulf Coast of Texas, and I've probably been through more hurricanes than anybody in the room. Contrary to my uh, children's belief, I was not in the 1900 storm uh, there in Texas. Hurricane Ike hit in 2008. Mr. Paulson, were you with FEMA in 2008? Okay. It has been called the third costliest hurricane in history. Almost 200 people killed and about 30 billion with a B dollars in damage. Uh, Hurricane Ike uh, hit the, the Gulf Coast about 18 to 20 miles east, east of uh, the Houston Ship Channel. Had it gone up through the Houston Ship Channel, it would have shut down about 30 to 40 percent of the nation's refining capacity and energy production. So for us, it's a very, very huge uh, area that we want to be sure that we get covered. We're in the process of trying to get some coastal barrier protection. And Mr. Bourbon, I think you mentioned Hurricane Ike in your testimony. You rarely hear about Hurricane Ike. It's called the Forgotten Hurricane because it happened September the 13th, 2008, and then the bottom dropped out of the housing market and the stock market about two or three weeks later. So about six million people there on the Texas Gulf Coast. As I said, a lot of energy production. Um, Mr. Bourbon, you mentioned that some communities never recover from those kinds of disasters. Galveston is one of those communities. The Galveston Island had 50,000 people in it, and as such, it, it met the level for, for uh, federal grants. Now that it dropped below 50,000, we're working on trying to get some language where communities that come back up following a federal disaster, whether it's a wildfire or whatever it is, could, uh, before the next census, get uh, that designation back. So uh, my question to you is, uh, if changes can be made to help, uh, this is for you, Mr. Bourbon, if changes can be made to better help communities access these programs following a major storm, would that have an impact on insurance markets, in your opinion? Yes, there's an, it's a great question. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. And we see it, you know, a real live uh, scenario that we see with properties that were constructed in the Gulf Coast of Texas. Um, during that hurricane, I believe there were 13 that were constructed with IBHS hurricane standards. Uh, there were 11 of those, and they were about the only 11 properties left at the end of that storm that were still standing. Um, so again, that from the dynamic of you know the insurability and the affordability, and we think about all of those issues, it all has to do with mitigating and preventing the loss where those payments go out. So by improving the infrastructure and the sustainability through these building codes, it has a direct impact on the availability and affordability of insurance, which as we all know is core to the overall uh, communities in which we live. Thank you for that response. I'm maybe one of the only ones here in, in the room that has built his own house on the Texas Gulf Coast and built it to hurricanes. In fact, built it beyond what, what we call windstorm program there in Brazoria County. Uh, we just went really above and beyond as my own contractor. I could do things that most people wouldn't necessarily have the time or the money to do. Um, so it's very important to us. We're working on having been part of this committee and Chairman Schuster uh, leading a great Codell over to the Netherlands a, la a couple of weeks back. We're watching the coastal barrier protection over there. I'm thinking that if we can protect, if the federal government could come in with about 15 billion with a B dollars worth, worth of protection on the upper Texas Gulf Coast, and we protect six million lives, homes, property, industry, refining industry, and actually probably about 20% of the nation's economy, then it would yield a lot of rewards. So uh, $15 billion worth of infrastructure on the front end might conceivably prevent, we had $30 billion in Ike, as I said, two, 200 uh, lives lost. Um, do you think that in and of itself would impact the way that industry does insurance? Talking about the refining industry now. Or do y'all just do strictly homes, residentials? More on the residential and the homes is the piece where we've been on, okay. on that piece. Okay. Well, I appreciate your indulgence, um, Mr. Chairman. I'm going to yield back. Thank you. Chair now recognizes Mr. Sears for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank the, the panelists, and I want to especially thank Mr. Fugate. I must have listened to you speak half a dozen times. 
and you're always available for us to speak. Uh, you know, my gripe is always the same. And, and when you were telling the story regarding the Arkansas school and then another, uh, uh, another storm came by and destroyed it, why do, if we destroy, if, if a storm destroyed a, a school, why do we build another school that can be destroyed by a storm? Why can we build that in a stronger, more um, storm, uh, how can I say it? Um, I'm looking for a word, but I can't think of it. But just to be able to withstand the storm. Why is it that we have to build it the same way? <laughs> well, sir, previously, before the Sandy Recovery Improvement Act, FEMA would have to look at whatever the local building codes were, and that's what we built back to. And anything above that would be mitigation. But one of the things the committee did in Sandy was they gave the president the authority to use model or standard building codes, and we were able to adopt that. It's hard to build a school that would not be damaged by a, a 4F5 tornado, but this was what I consider almost criminal. We'd build it back without a safe room. So we took the work the International Code Council had done to develop standards for safe rooms to provide those tornado-hardened rooms to withstand the F5 tornado, so at least we were saving lives. And President Obama directed that we find a better solution after more. Well, the committee had given us a tool that allowed us to go above what the local building codes were and began using that to put in safe rooms in all new construction after disasters. When we rebuild, if it's substantially damaged and it was a school, we're going to put a safe room in there. Um, so that was one of the things you did recognize on the committee, that many times when we're rebuilding, even if state and local codes weren't strong enough, FEMA should be building that into the repairs without having to do cost-benefit analysis or defaulting back to just mitigation. That it should be based upon the best science, best available data at the time of the damage to build back to and really look to build to the future risk. So when that school got destroyed, we didn't have that tool. After that, we started building back. And so after more Oklahoma, uh, FEMA's policy has been to use the tools we got in the Sandy Recru Recovery Improvement Act. Um, unless the jurisdiction says no, we will not fund rebuilding substantially damaged schools without safe rooms. We may not be able to stop all the damage in a tornado, but we want to make sure that we can provide survivable space for those children if a tornado threatens again. Thank you. You know, sometimes I think it's just common sense, some of the things that we just don't do. You know, I lived with Sandy was very, uh, in New Jersey, where it was very damaging. And I remember going to the train station and just the electrical boxes were put on the floor. I mean, nobody thought at the time to put in these electrical boxes on the floor that one day they were gonna get wet. So now they decided to put them up on the, on, on, on the, um, on the ceiling. Uh, the other thing is these um, uh, electrical centers, these uh, transformers, they put them in a flood area that were, that were low, so now they're raising them. But the problem in New Jersey, you also have people want to live on the beach, but they want to live on top of the beach. And, and to me, that, that was always a problem, even when I was in the state legislature. You just can't build sometimes in areas where they are now. And I don't know how you educate people. You know, I've been working on this, uh, this National Mitigation Investment Act with uh, Carlos Cubrello from Florida to try to provide uh, incentives for the states. But why, uh, what actually works? What is the most effective incentive that you can give a state to do some sort of mitigation work other than money? Well, one of the proposals we talked about earlier was uh, on, the, on the disaster side uh, if they do what they're supposed to do, give them a few more dollars, make it an 80% instead of 75. And if they don't do it, cut it down to 60. I mean, that's my recommendation. Of course, it's something for your discussion, obviously. But uh, there has to be an incentive, and there also has to be a disincentive uh, for, for not doing what you're supposed to, what the states are supposed to do. And don't forget, Hurricane Sandy was not a very powerful storm, it bar barely a Category 1. So what if you'd have had a Category 4 or 5? Uh, like we have in South Florida, and I disagree with Mr. Weber. I'm, very, I'm in South Florida. I have a lot of hurricanes, too. <laughs> yeah. I, and, and, and the other thing is, you know, some of these areas where Sandy hit, they're all areas. You know, they, they, they have a lot of 
one of the things that people didn't notice is, for example, the city of Hoboken, there were over a thousand apartments that were in basements that were flooded. And that was an issue with the insurance companies. You know, in urban areas that are really densely populated, people do live. And, you know, now you had to fight the insurance company because they didn't want to pay. So, you know, this, this whole thing is just difficult to, uh, to work through sometimes. Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. The chair now recognizes Mr. Fassel for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate the panel coming here today. And I'm intrigued by, um, I think it was uh, Administrator Fugate, maybe Paulson, you touched on this as well, the notion of uh, municipalities not, proper, not insuring their public buildings. And uh, are, there, are there instances around the country where uh, municipalities are typically doing this? We had a significant storm in my district, uh, Irene and Lee. Uh, the Schoharie County Courthouse was, was completely flooded. It had never happened before. It had uh, basically destroyed all of their public records dating back uh, well over 100 years. And the, uh, the building was, was obviously the basement flooded, but also was well up uh, on the walls on the first floor of that courthouse. And FEMA did fund a, uh, a substantial uh, mitigation and repair effort there. So just in terms of, of trying to get municipalities, incentivize them to carry insurance, um, can you talk a little more about that and, and where around the country are municipalities actually doing so? Well, the problem's all over the place, um, and it could be side by side. I think uh, you may want to put a question in for the record to FEMA to show how many times they pay for uninsured losses on structures. That would be your best indicator. That would be a, an excellent idea. Perhaps, Mr. Chairman, we can have the committee submit such a question to FEMA and have them place that in the record at this point. Not being there, I don't mind giving them extra work. That's... Uh... <laughs> but um, one of the things that, uh, and this is something else I think the, the committee should look at, FEMA has a requirement that if we pay the first time, you should carry, you're required to carry insurance for the life of that afterwards. Uh, but there's a clause in there that the state insurance commissioner says it was neither affordable or available. We'll pay the second, third, fourth time. Now, FEMA's rule says we shouldn't be doing that, but the reality is FEMA is, is susceptible to member pressure to try to find a way to get the yes. And in many cases, we have bent ourselves in the pretzel to get the yes to repair that structure the second or third time. Um, I think it would be helpful to FEMA to get the intent of Congress and more clearly stipulate that if you are damaged the first time and you weren't insured, okay, we got you. We're going to repair it. We'll put mitigation in it. But we'll never come back to that structure again. You must carry insurance for that risk. Um, I think that needs to come from Congress because too often when FEMA has that discretion, the pressure to find a way to yes is so strong that we oftentimes repair it a second, sometimes a third time. And, and when, you're, when you're mentioning uh, public infrastructure, are you including, I, I didn't quite hear your answer uh, before, are you including infrastructure such as roads and bridges? I would defer on roads and bridges because that's uh, something that I'm not sure how you insure, but I would figure if it's got a wall and it has an occupancy of stuff or people, it ought to be insured. And generally on the building side, uh, where it's contents, it, uh, I've been in many, uh, like Dave says in Florida, we probably rebuilt half the fire stations across South Florida. And think about it. The only reason we were paying as a federal government was because they didn't have insurance on those fire stations. Now, I'm not going to hold the fire chiefs accountable because their budgets are set by those city and county commissioners. But somebody's making a decision to go self-insurance and hope somebody else will pick up the check if it's really bad. It is always the iron law of government, as I've found, <clears throat> is that it's always easier to spend someone else's money. Yes, sir. And uh, now, uh, Administrator Paulson, uh, you had, um, uh, we talked about, uh, both you and Administrator Fugate had, had talked about the, the issue of um, state building codes and creating an incentive if, if a state had a modern building code. Um, could you uh, give us a little more information in terms of, of which states might be at the really complying with your goal, and how would we, what's, what's the standard which we should potentially put in law 
to determine which states might be reimbursed at the higher rate as opposed to those who were laggards and would be reimbursed at a lower rate rather than that 75 percent? Well, I'll just talk about my own state, the state of Florida, uh, where we do have a statewide building code, and we actually beefed up that code based on the damage we saw during Hurricane Andrew. Uh, we totally changed it. Now, we had to fight with, you know, with some of the contractors because they thought we were going to raise the cost of houses beyond what people could afford, and it, it didn't happen. Uh, so we pushed hard to change the code, look very clearly at what type of damage we had and why did these homes fail. And I'm talking about brand new homes that failed, an area called Country Walk. Uh, these are brand new homes and every one of them failed. So why did they fail? We had engineers look at that and based on that, we looked, took a step back, okay, here's why they failed, what can we do to fix it where they don't fail the same way again? So a state like Florida would definitely get an incentive because they've done this and they enforced their building codes. There may be another state, and I won't pick on anybody, but let's say they don't have a statewide building code or they have one and it's not being enforced. Uh, and so we're gonna rebuild those homes back time and time again uh, either through insurance costs or through costs from, from FEMA or somebody else, it still falls back to the taxpayer. If a, if a state A doesn't have a code and it blows down, well, all of our insurance rates go up to compensate for what's happened. So it still comes back to the taxpayer. So, uh, so I'm saying let's, you know, let's be the adult here. Uh, I just think Congress needs to step up and say uh, that if you don't have a statewide building code, if it's not being enforced, uh, there's got to be a cost to that. Thank you. Uh, I thank the panel. I yield back. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Ferguson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for taking time to come meet with us today. A um, couple, one, couple of questions. First of all, um, Mr. Paulson, your, your comments about not adding a lot of cost to, the, to construction, particularly in Florida, related to, to, say, hurricane damage and the things that you, that you described, I, I agree with you. Thinking about it regionally, and this is more just a curiosity question, Mr. Phelps, how much more does it cost to build a home to make it earthquake resistant? I realize there's no such thing as earthquake proof, but I mean, is there, I mean, because there's a big difference between putting a few more nails in and changing the roof design as opposed to building one for earthquake. Right. That's an excellent question. Most of the uh, improvements that can be made, whether it's uh, building new construction or retrofitting an existing single-family home, are relatively inexpensive. Things like strapping uh, water heaters to the walls, uh, a couple of bucks for some metal strapping and some screws into a stud, goes a long way towards having your house burn down or, or be flooded following an earthquake. Uh, more robust improvements, uh, like strapping the home to the foundation if it was built, uh, generally speaking, 40 years ago or so when homes were not actually attached to their foundation, which when I think about kind of blows my mind a little bit, uh, but that was the case. Uh, those projects can, can be three, four, five thousand dollars depending on the size of the home. So it's a relatively small investment, and, and again, we've been very grateful in Oregon to be able to use some pre-disaster mitigation funds to do just that and work with homeowners uh, to, to defray some of those costs on, on some of those expenses. So it's relatively inexpensive to retrofit, and I would imagine even less expensive to include those costs up front uh, during uh, new construction. Okay. Um, so y'all, you like the idea of the, obviously the, the, the statewide building codes. Um, does that tend to have a regional component to it as well? I mean, are you thinking that maybe they're, they're, you get to the point that you have regional building codes for something like um, a fault line or an earth or, or a hurricane section? Yeah, even in Florida, we have uh, uh, codes, although we have a statewide building codes, some of the counties, uh, particularly Monroe County and the Keys, Dade, Broward, and Palm Beach County, is a little bit tougher uh, code than what you would have in the middle part of the state. So, yeah, it's, although there is a statewide building code, you look at the type of damage you, or type of uh, disaster you may have and what kind of damage it can cause, and you modify the code through that whole state. Uh, and, and along those lines, every state's not the same. We don't do earthquake mitigation in South Florida, uh, but then in, in, uh, in Idaho, they're not going to do hurricane preparedness either. So every state's going to be different. What we're saying is look at the type of natural disaster you may have in your particular state or your particular area and develop your codes to mitigate that type of damage. If we do that, it'll save this country literally billions of dollars. Okay. Um, Mr. F uh, Fugate, question for you. Why it, it appears that when there's a natural disaster, there's a really, uh, really high impact on small businesses. 
Can you tell me why you, based on your experience, why this number of, uh, of new businesses failing to reopen is so high? They can't, affect, they can't survive the cash flow and the cost. They're a small business. They don't have reserves. They cannot distribute their losses over a large corporate footprint. So they tend to be the most vulnerable. And I thought, as we talked about all those billions of dollars, they don't go to small business. The only thing small businesses can potentially get is small business administration disaster loans. So we have seen, my experience in Florida, but seen now at FEMA across the nation, is we see failure rates of 40 to 70 percent of small businesses do not make it through the disaster. The reasons are uh, no workforce, no customers, lack of housing, can't handle the cash flow. And I tell some businesses, I said, this is a harsh reality. Reopening may not be your best option. Your best option may be to preserve your capital, cash out your insurance, and wait for conditions to improve. Um, and that's kind of harsh when local builders or local officials are trying to get their community back up and their tax base back up. But this is a harsh reality. Small businesses do not have a distributed footprint to absorb this. And our current programs are essentially a loan program that in many cases is a lifeline to nothing. It just gets them over a little bit, but they still end up failing because they don't get over the uh, original impact. What, what, what would be your idea of a solution to, to address that issue? Well, the first thing is, is, is kind of the basic stuff we're talking about, about homes, is building more resilient uh, construction uh, for the businesses, but also doing something that I found that I learned of all places when we were down helping out USAID in Haiti, is you got to buy local and hire local. If we're not putting money back in the local economy, we're not targeting the local businesses, if we're always bringing help in from the outside, you miss opportunities. We spend hundreds of millions of dollars in response phases and initial housing uh, and a lot of things that locally, if we did a better job of tacky, tapping into that, we help. And I think this is something the committee needs to provide oversight to FEMA on is the tendency is we go with a lot of big contracts, we bring in a lot of folks from the outside to help, but a lot of times the best resources were right there in that community and we didn't hire them. And we didn't put them to work. So I think that's one thing you should continue to hammer us over is buy local and hire local from those local communities. That's the best thing we can do for small business uh, in a disaster is give them work and give them some income. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Mass stepped out, so I'll begin the second round. Uh, Administrator Fugate, uh, earlier this year I introduced in the House passed uh, the Disaster Save Act, which would increase FEMA's small project threshold to $500,000. Uh, do you support this legislation, and uh, could you describe how you think it could speed up disaster recovery, reduce administrative burdens, and lower costs? Mr. Chairman, I supported you when you had it at a million dollars, but I understand that people were a little squeamish about that. But the idea that on small projects, um, we pretty much end up spending about as much money sometimes on small projects as we do big ones because of the overhead. By increasing the threshold, I believe by going to uh, uh, half a million dollars, I think FEMA says that's going to be about 97 percent of what we actually do. It reduces the overhead burden on local governments and states. I don't think it increases the risk to the federal taxpayer, uh, and the oversight really isn't saving us. If we're going to do that kind of oversight, let's do it on the big projects, and you gave us great tools to do cost estimates and speed that up, but on smaller projects, I think the risk of not providing that degree of oversight is more than compensated by the controls in place at state and local government, and the savings would be tremendous. Again, FEMA estimates that of the projects they write, they could get almost 97% of what they write into that threshold, which reduces burden of, of regulatory oversight for state and local governments, reduces FEMA's cost in administering the grants, and I don't think increases the risk to the taxpayer uh, by eliminating a lot of that process. Right, sir. That, 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 we got a project right now. We have a you know, back in my district where uh, the administrative costs that they're trying, that, that, that they're spending will be more than what they're trying to recover. Oh, absolutely. Uh, since September 11, 2001, DHS has provided over $40 billion in preparedness grants to state, local, and tribal governments uh, to strengthen their uh, preparedness to terrorism and other hazards. Uh, Chief Sinclair, as a, as a former mayor, I know how critical assistance to firefighters' grants can be to local fire stations in obtaining the personal protective equipment that they need. And can you tell us how fire grants and other preparedness grants help 
our first responders prepare to manage the consequences of all hazards and what might happen if those capabilities were removed or diminished? Thank you very much, Chairman Barletta, for the question. Um, in my uh, written testimony, one of the things that we referenced is the National Fire Protection Association just did their fourth needs assessment of the fire service. And one of the things that that points out are all of the deficiencies that still currently exist. Uh, the AFG and the SAFER grant programs have been uh, very good for providing opportunities for people to upgrade their equipment. I can tell you that in uh, 2007 and 2008, at my local organization, we were able to put in um, an AFG grant that allowed us to um, replace uh, very essential bunker ensembles and the uh, self-contained breathing apparatus uh, ensembles that we were unable to at that particular time. What that allowed us to do was take two organizations, um, a city and a fire district, merge those together uh, and become a much more effective and efficient system for the community. And it was the seed money from that purchase that got us working together and it ultimately led to a merger. The, the issue is, is that um, you broaden that out to the Shush Gap and Uasi money and one of the things that we see there is that you've got people that are looking at this from an all hazards perspective and they're working together. One of the things that we saw uh, locally is that by working together and uh, it allowed us to go through flooding events, wildfire events, and a blizzard event where every road into our community was cut off and the just-in-time supply piece cut in. So we wound up working with the health department, local law enforcement, and all of the other providers. But it was those seed money that allowed us to begin that planning process, and it made us a much more resilient community. Thank you. Uh, Chair now re uh, recognizes Ranking Member Johnson for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Phelps. Uh, you discussed how FEMA piloted its public assistance re-engineering process with a 2016 disaster in Oregon that resulted in a substantial increase in the use of hazard mitigation. The state of Oregon received a disaster declaration earlier this year. Was the state able to replicate the increased use of mitigation in the 2017 disaster recovery? Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, we were not to such a great extent, uh, primarily just because of the nature of the damages. Uh, the 2016 declaration was more permanent work, repairing the infrastructure that has been spoken about uh, today. The more recent disaster declaration uh, was a lot of what we call Category A and Category B damages, debris removal and emergency uh, response measures uh, to be reimbursed through that federal disaster declaration. Uh, the handful of projects that we did have that involved permanent work, we certainly are considering mitigation. Our goal is for 100 percent of those projects, and right now we're at about 25 or 30 percent of those projects with uh, mitigation work being done on those those permanent repairs. Thank you. Um, other, recom other witnesses recommend allowing mitigation funds to be used to develop and enforce statewide building codes. Do you have any thoughts on whether this is an issue of lack of funding, that some areas do not adopt statewide building codes, or is it an issue of the lack of willingness to adopt those codes? I, I don't believe in my experience it's the lack of, of funding so much, uh, but it's the, the perceived cost burden, perhaps, on, on increasing the, the building codes. Uh, I had heard a statistic, I can't verify uh, the accuracy of it, but for every $1,000 a home increases, 100,000 people are priced out of purchasing that home. Uh, so every increase in the cost of building a home uh, certainly uh, has an impact on, on who can afford uh, homes, and, and in Oregon we have uh, affordable housing concerns, to be sure. Uh, I think the building codes are one piece of it, but another piece is probably land use planning and how we look at where we're building in, in relation to coastal areas, in floodplains, and certainly the wildland-urban interface uh, where homes become much more uh, uh, susceptible to the threat of wildfire. Mm -hmm. What has prompted the state of Oregon to invest in mitigation? Uh, we talked a little bit today about the carrot and stick approach. 
Uh, I, I think I can say uh, with 100% certainty that the carrot for Oregon uh, to do mitigation and robust mitigation and ed educate our policymakers on the importance of it, mitigation uh, is not the promise of federal disaster dollars. Uh, we tend to wear, as emergency management directors at the state level, disasters, federal disaster declarations as notches on our belts. Uh, I would have been perfectly pleased going through my entire career never having received a federal disaster declaration. Sadly, in two years, that has not been the case, and I've been blessed with uh, a few federal de uh, disaster declarations. Our primary incentive is to save lives, uh, protect property, and reduce impact to the environment and the economy. That's what drives us to do the robust mitigation work we do. It's, it's to try to limit the forecasted 10,000 dead and injured after a Cascadia subduction zone earthquake, uh, so that number uh, isn't nearly as great. Think anyone wanna add to that? Okay, uh, from a state's pers perspective, uh, Mr. Phelps, uh, do you see any problems with requiring infrastructure built or repaired with federal FEMA assistance to be constructed to meet the latest model building code? I think we would welcome the opportunity to rebuild any damaged infrastructure during a disaster uh, to whatever code is needed to withstand future uh, stressors uh, following disasters. There's talk uh, when, when FEMA comes in to help rebuild infrastructure, building it back to pre-disaster condition. Uh, more often than not, that's not acceptable and you're gonna find yourself in the uh, cycle of damages and disaster that has been referenced earlier. So certainly would welcome that opportunity. Thank you. Uh, Chief Sinclair, you discussed the lack of training for many local fire departments, do you have a recommendation on how to improve the availability of FEMA or Department of Homeland Security training programs for local fire departments? Thank you very much for the question. Um, certainly, uh, our prem premier uh, training organization that we utilize is the U.S. Fire Administration and the National Fire Academy. Um, they do a couple of different approaches to this. Uh, they have uh, on-site courses, and they also work with the state fire training directors to send courses out. Uh, what we are constantly doing is taking a look at what those evolving threats are and getting those types of information out. There are other grant programs, such as the ALERT grants, that allow us to take specific um, training, for example, uh, railway safety um, classes, especially out into the rural areas, and it is important for us to have a myriad of different ways to approach that training. If you take a look at the railroad system and uh, the Balkan crude issue, the majority of the places where they've had issues is out in rural areas, and so every fire department that is on that rail, rail line needs to know how to mitigate a, an actual event. So there's a host of different things. When you're talking about the U.S. Fire Administration, they have established classes. Every time they go out and update those classes, it takes money to be able to do that. And that's one of the reasons why in our testimony we're asking for the U.S. Fire Administration to be um, fully funded. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The chair recognizes Mr. Mast. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, you know, I'd like to dig a little bit more into the, uh, the burden of the state government, the burden of individuals, uh, individual property owners, and, and what is the burden of the federal government. Uh, basically, should states and individuals have to insure against the federal government creating an emergency for those entities. And uh, to put this in context, in 2016 and years prior, the federal government released trillions of gallons of literally toxic algal blooms into my community uh, on the east coast of Florida, uh, freshwater algal blooms into saltwater estuaries from separate bodies of water. Um, and it was done because they were worried about a failing dike that surrounds Lake Okeechobee in our community mm -hmm. and what it would have done to the communities south of that lake had that, that dike been breached. And uh, as a result of those, those trillions of gallons of toxic algal bloom that was released into the community, it devastated human health, it devastated wildlife, devastated the economy. Um, so my question uh, is for Mr. Fugate. Uh, if the Hoover Dike, for which the federal government does have uh, sole responsibility, had failed, 
like what happened in New Orleans, uh, would FEMA have helped those flooded communities? Yes, but you're asking an actually a very simplistic question because nobody wants to deal with why all the toxic waste is in Lake Okeechobee from the farmland runoffs. And that dike is providing your drinking water supply in the dry seasons. So it's not a simple answer of one release causes another problem. That is a whole ecosystem that has a lot of issues. But would FEMA have covered a flooded community if the dike had breached around Lake Okeechobee, just like what happened in, in, in New Orleans? Yes. That's what I figured. And uh, as FEMA's chief administrator, last year twice you signed off uh, to say that an emergency declaration uh, that our state requested would be denied. Uh, and, and despite the fact that it was the federal government who was the, the sole arbiter of releasing these trillions of gallons of, of toxic water into the communities. So what I'm basically hearing is that if the federal government had overseen a failing dike, they would have come to our aid, they would have come to our assistance, but when the federal government releases trillions of gallons of toxins, they are going to hang us out to dry, they're not going to provide any assistance, they're gonna say uh, basically that you're on your own. You know, I've been in the state of Florida as state director through a lot of algae blooms and releases. My job was to make a recommendation to the president and point out whether or not that release exceeded the state's capabilities to manage. Other than economic losses, you did not demonstrate any other types of losses. Generally, FEMA does not reimburse for economic losses or nuisance events. So when we evaluated the criteria, it did not meet the criteria to make the recommendation. Ultimately, that was the President's decision. So I do want to get into that criteria a little bit. First, Mr. Chairman, I would ask uh, unanimous consent that the, uh, the official correspondence uh, between our Florida State Governor Scott and the uh, FEMA Administrator Fugate uh, be included in the, uh, in the record uh, in these letters, please. Um, no objection. Mr. Fugate, uh, there are some other, some other areas on that I want to touch, and that's basically this. Does the federal government's role in causing uh, an emergency situation, does that play into the decision-making process, and should it play into the decision-making process? Depending upon the types of impacts, the Stafford Act is directed towards the impacts to state and local governments from a causative eligible event. Stafford Act defines what those eligible events are for major presidential disaster declarations and gives guidance on what is an emergency declaration. It does not always specify whether or not the responsible party is present, but generally when there's a responsible party, it's a responsible party in that program that is looked at for the cost or the reimbursements. <coughs> Several examples of this were other events where other federal agencies had the lead role uh, for events that did occur that did not trigger a Stafford Act declaration even though it was requested. So the, re the denial of the state of Florida's request was not unique in the administration. There were other events that had occurred where federal government events were attributed to having caused that disaster, uh, it was not determined to meet the Stafford Act. There were other events, though, such as uh, fires that had met triggering events from control burns, and FEMA was directed through legislative action to provide assistance due to control burns that resulted in fires off the federal property, and FEMA did administer those programs at the direction of Congress. But I think in many cases, the Stafford Act does have its limitations. If it is Congress's intent to fund that type of response, Congress could provide additional clarification and guidance to those events. Uh, Chairman, I'll yield back unless you want to give me a second round of, uh, second round of time. All right, since you missed your turn, you can Perfect. continue. Thank you. Uh, I just have a couple more questions in the same line. Uh, Mr. Fugate, uh, this is a little bit about state population size. In, in regards to the same issue, uh, the state of Florida was noted by, uh, by your director of communications saying the, the state of Florida is the largest state in the nation, uh, one of the largest states uh, with a population of almost 20 million people, has a robust capability to respond to emergencies and disasters. Um, does the phrase state population size, does that, is that a place, uh, something that appears anywhere in the Stafford Act? No, but in the guidance that FEMA uses in determining the impacts to disaster, you do look at the size and capabilities of state. Per capita, a loss of eligible losses on a per capita basis is one of the factors that FEMA uses in calculating the threshold for disaster declarations. So it doesn't appear anywhere in there, but uh, should there be a hurricane or a wildfire or something else, FEMA is going to take into consideration a, a state's size and population. 
yes, it looks at the per capita impacts as one of the determinations, did it exceed state capabilities? Okay. Uh, thank you for your responses. Uh, I know you're highly regarded in the emergency management uh, circles and for your work under uh, Florida's Governor Bush, so I appreciate your responses and thank you for your time. The chair recognizes Mr. Graves for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here today. Um, uh, Administrator Fugate, uh, Administrator Paulson, uh, um, Louisiana has had probably more than its share of disasters, um, and uh, everything from Hurricane Katrina to the, to the August flood, which I believe FEMA has indicated is the fourth most costly flood disaster in, in, in U.S. history, um, a, a consistent theme comes up in each of these, and that is that what we see over and over and over and over again is that um, floods happen, disasters happen, and there were mitigation projects that were on the books that could have been done that would have prevented these. In the case of Hurricane Katrina, uh, some of the projects dated back to the 1960s. Um, and these are Corps of Engineers projects. Uh, Administrator Fugate, uh, following Hurricanes Gustav and Ike, as I recall, in 2011, you and I rode around all around the North Shore and Plaquemines Parish and other places talking about some of this. And, and you know, FEMA has its pre-disaster mitigation, hazard mitigation uh, grant program and other things. And, and you know, the, the efficacy of these programs, Administrator Fugate, you as you've testified before this committee, um, they're extraordinary. Uh, studies indicating that you, you get $3 in cost savings for every $1 you invested. I've seen other studies that have uh, numbers that are, that are beyond there. And I, I certainly think it, the numbers are higher. Um, can you comment on your opinions now that you're both totally free? Uh, uh, the, can you comment on your opinion? We have the Corps of Engineers involved in resiliency. We have HUD. We have Interior. We have USDA. We have FEMA. But just on, on the amount of money we spend, how we prioritize and coordinate these investments uh, as compared to the amount of money we spend following a disaster? Well, we represented, you know, as we talked and we walked uh, those parishes. Uh, and many of those parish presidents were indicating they had projects on the books that just weren't funded. They, and this is, I think, uh, something that this committee's looked at is the, how we've divided up disaster response. People look at FEMA's budget, and that's just a, a, in many cases, just a small pool of what's actually going out there. And a lot of times what will happen is we'll end up with programs that get authorized, but there's never any funding. And then the Corps of Engineers has to take what limited funding they have and across a nation now figure out where they're going to fund those priorities. I think, again, it would be helpful for Congress to give more direction to the agencies to work on uh, something we ask states to do, a national, you know, statewide mitigation strategies. Perhaps an idea for this committee to consider is a national mitigation strategy to at least draw the thread between all the various committees and the funding sources of saying we've got finite resources, but we're spreading the mitigation around all over the place and not really getting to the critical mass. Maybe if it was the intent of Congress to look at this funding and direct it more towards where the national interests are, where we see the greatest disaster risk, maybe a way to get some better utilization of that. But I would suggest that that would be something that Congress and in the, in the intent and will of a national mitigation strategy that all agencies would be working from versus each agency trying to figure out where they're going to get the biggest impacts. Thank you. I think that's a fantastic uh, perspective. I, 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 I want to push back a little bit on the Corps of Engineers. I don't think it's just the funding issue. I think the Corps has wrapped themselves around the actual and in many cases simply uh, in, in, incapable of, of delivering projects, but that's a separate discussion. Administrator Paulson, do you care to, to add any perspective there? Yeah, I think we touched on something here we need to, we need to deal with. One, there are FEMA was created to make sure that we had one belly button, one point of contact for disaster re response and, and mitigation issues. Now it's kind of morphed. We've had this. Uh, did you say belly button? We've had this. I did say belly button, yeah. <laughs> uh, so we have, now we have this mission creep. We have uh, disaster programs across the federal government. Uh, Department of Transportation has them, uh, HUD has them, and they're all over the place. I think we need to. I think Congress needs to focus these things back where they belong, put them back into FEMA, or put them under the control of FEMA, so we can have a cost-benefit benefit analysis of each prog prog uh, program that goes out there, of each thing we're going to be doing. Because right now, we really don't have a handle on how much money we're spending on these disasters. You know, we, we kind of think we do, but we really don't, because it's coming from a, a multitude of, of agencies. You know, I, my recommendation is to put them back under the control, if not under FEMA, at least under the control of FEMA, so we know how much money we're spending. We know what is, is, what is it being spent on, and is it being, being spent on something that needs to be done? 
uh, sometimes we're just spending on stuff that's foolishness. So uh, I think that the whole thing of the mitigation thing, let's go back to where we were yeah. back when FEMA, and why FEMA was created to begin with. Um, you're both coming from FEMA, runs NFIP, and then you also respond to disasters. Do you think this continued policy of having a divorce or insulation between the flood insurance program and where we invest our resiliency dollars should continue? No. The, uh, you know, first of all, we've got to figure out the flood insurance program uh, cannot run as a pure insurance company. It's got to look at factories. We've got a built environment that's not going to change overnight. So we need to really put more emphasis on where our greatest exposure is in the flood insurance program and, again, prioritize where we're going to put our resources because the flood insurance program itself doesn't generate the revenue to provide the additional funds for buyouts and mitigation. Uh, Pre-disaster mitigation, again, it's just not going to be enough. It really is going to take us taking a step back. And, and, and if there's opportunities in national infrastructure investments, let's buy down our risk, particularly in flood insurance. I just read Congressional Budget Office. We are... Uh, about a trillion dollars exposure just on one hurricane on the East Coast. We subsidize 25 percent of those policies, inland communities subsidize coastal communities, and it's not sustainable. So let's buy our risk down by making smarter investments on mitigation. Amen. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for your uh, testimony today. Your comments have been helpful. Uh, to today's discussions. If there are no further questions, I would ask unanimous consent that the record of today's hearing remain open until such time as our witnesses have provided answers to any questions that may be submitted to them in writing and unanimous consent that the record remain open for 15 days for any additional comments and information submitted by members or witnesses to be included in the record of today's hearing without objection so ordered. I'd like to thank our witnesses again. Uh, for their testimony today. If no other members have anything to add, this subcommittee stands adjourned.